wanted to move on in the sort of second half to look at how some of these themes get picked up elsewhere in later Greek art and architecture um, and what they mean then. So we're moving now eastwards from mainland Greece to Asia Minor, which is um, an area that I teach a course on at Warwick. So we have a whole, whole module on art and architecture of Asia Minor. Um, and we're going to be focusing first on the city of Pergamum, um, which is the capital of the Attalid dynasty in the Hellenistic period. Um, the Hellenistic period is the period after Alexander the Great. So Alexander goes off, um, conquers the Persian Empire, uh, acquires vast amounts of land and territory. And then after his death, that territory kind of gets broken up and divided between his various successors. Um, and at Pergamum in the third century BC, you get the rise of the Attalid dynasty, um, who are quite small um, in terms of the area they lack, they, they, they come into um, ownership of, so compared to something like the Ptolemies who take over Egypt or the Seleucids who take over um, sort of very modern day Syria, um, the Pergamon Empire has this sort of western bit of Asia Minor under its rulership. Um, but they very much wanted to promote themselves as almost being like a second Athens, as a sort of new Athens in the Hellenistic period. Um, so one of the great monuments of the um, city of Pergamum is the Great Altar, which is now in Berlin in the Pergamon Museum. I think it's still being refurbished at the moment, but it's worth going to see when it's open. Um, it was excavated by the Germans at the end of the 19th century, um, taken mostly to uh, Pergamon. So this is a really curious monument because it's absolutely huge. So it's much bigger than um, an altar normally be, would be. Normally you expect to see altars outside the temple, to the east of the temple, um, and the altar is the area where you make your offerings, particularly sacrifice. So altars are very central in Greek religion as the point at which you actually um, make your offerings to the god. Um, but this altar doesn't obviously have a temple that it belongs to, so there is a temple of Athena on the Acropolis, but it's on a higher platform than the great altar of Pergamon. Um, and we don't know for certain who it was actually dedicated to. Um, it's either dedicated to Zeus, there's a, a literary reference that suggests that, or possibly to Athena, or possibly to both of them. Um, Athena is a very important goddess for the Pergamon dynasty because she's their patron goddess, they have a temple to her on the Acropolis, um, and they also honoured her as Athena Nekephoros, Athena who brings victory, um, in connection with their victories, their military victories both over other Hellenistic kings like the Seleucids, but also over the Gauls, who are this tribe of northerns, um, uh, northern tribes that came down into Asia Minor and conducted raids of their territory. And the Gauls are very much um, represented in the literature, again, as being kind of others, as non-Greeks, as, as barbarians. There's a whole discussion about, you know, the idea of othering in, in culture and, and how we might sort of try to unpick that I suppose but but that's that's the way they're represented. So the Great Altar Pergamum is uh, massive in scale it did it sort of seemed to have another an altar table in the middle of it um, and it takes this sort of horseshoe shape um, form so on the outside you have a, a long frieze which shows the gigantomachy um, which is much lower than the friezes that you find on temples, so it's much more visible to the, the viewer. You can actually make out the details very clearly. Um, when you're thinking about something like the Parthenon, one of the questions always is, you know, how much of the frieze could you see when it was stuck up there in the kind of the, the twilight of the um, colonnade? Uh, with the Great Altar, you could see things very clearly. Um, on the inside, there was another relief which had the story of the legendary founder of the city, Telephus. Um, and the altar table in the centre and then these steps that lead up. Um, but we don't know how much it's supposed to be a victory monument or how much it's supposed to be a kind of functioning altar, functioning religious monument, and possibly it combines both of those functions. Um, so this is the eastern side of the great altar. This is the side that when you came into the precinct where it was, you would see first. And on this side we have um, Zeus on the left and Athena on the right. And they are identified um, particularly by their iconography. So with Athena, she's wearing a helmet that's broken off. You can see the outlines of it. She has her shield, she has the aegis on her chest. Um, and uh, there's also inscriptions that identify a number of these figures as well. So we don't have the inscriptions remaining for all of them, but we do for quite a few of them. Um, so this scene sort of, it's the most prominent scene 
that you see when you come to the altar to start with. Um, and this is partly why people debate whether it was dedicated to Zeus or to Athena or possibly to both of them. And they're shown killing, battling with the giants. Um, here the gods are very much in the ascendancy, they are um, the standing figures, the giants generally are the ones who are sort of falling to their knees, um, and the giants are depicted as kind of half human, half beast. So they have things like snake legs that you see here, sometimes they have wings as again you see here, and there's lots of play of textures here. Um, so the style of this is what's known as the Pergamene Baroque. It's a, a kind of move on from the sort of classical style that you get in the 5th century BC um, with the naturalistic classical style. And it's um, characterised particularly by sort of very deep undercutting. So although these are relief figures, they're attached to a background, they kind of come out much more than say the reliefs on the Parthenon do. Um, and this interest in different textures and kind of dramatic poses and dramatic facial expressions. So if you look at this figure here, he's got very deeply cut eyes, um, very sort of anguished look on his face. Um, here, another part of the east side of the frieze, we've got another Olympian family group. So here we've got Leto, who's the mother of um, Artemis and Apollo, and they're flanking on either side. And again, the iconography of these statues shows who they are. So um, Artemis, for example, is often depicted in this sort of hunting dress with her boots and her quiver over her shoulder. So the, you have this sort of combination of, of gods and goddesses shown defeating the giants. Um, there's been quite a lot of debate as to kind of why all these giant, all these different gods are shown because in addition to the normal Olympian gods, which we see quite a lot in uh, gigantomachy scenes, there are also lots of other gods. Uh, one of the really interesting things about this is that they're named. So the, um, the great altar had inscriptions labeling the different figures, both the gods and the giants um, on the background above them, and below them. So on this side, which is the steps leading up, we've actually got various gods to do with the sea, for example. Um, and then there's a, this is not a very good picture, I'm afraid, but it's a drawing just showing you some of the different um, arrangement of the different gods on the different sides. So it seems as though on the west side, there was sort of a sea theme. On the south, a lot of the gods are to do with light. Um, so we have Helios, for example. Um, the East Frieze is the Olympian gods, um, so the, the most sort of canonical top gods of the pantheon. And then the North Frieze has particularly the gods associated with the night. Um, and one of the suggestions is that this is a way not only to commemorate the gods and their power, but also to show um, Pergamum's intellectual prowess as well. So Pergamum is one of the two places in the Hellenistic world that has a very important library. You might have heard of the Library of Alexandria, but we also have the Library of Pergamum, um, which rivals the Library of Alexandria. So they are a home for scholars, for intellectual um, research, and it's a place where there are a number of philosophers and uh, sort of thinkers. So there's one figure, Crates and Malas, who um, was based at Pergamene Court, who is supposed to have written a, um, a, a work on the giants. So whether this is um, kind of reflecting local uh, research into the gigantomachy. There's also a suggestion it might echo how uh, Hesiod's Theogony as well in terms of the family groups that are represented here. So it seems to be, it's a very intellectual, it's very erudite freeze. It, it tells the story of the power of the Greeks against the giants, but it also tells um, about sort of Parthenon, uh, Pergamon's powers as well. Um, so in terms of the, the story as a metaphor, it's also been seen this kind of idea of good against evil as reflecting the Attalid um, victory monuments that, uh, and their victories against the Gauls. So um, we also know that the Attalid set up some dedications in Athens um, and uh, these were put on the Athenian Acropolis. And there again, they're kind of trying to link themselves and their achievements with the achievements, both of the Athenians, but also these mythological achievements as well. So we're told that there was a series of dedications that showed the Gigantomachy, the War of the Gods Against the Giants, the Athenian battle with the Amazons, the uh, battle between the Athenians and the Persians at Marathon, and then the destruction of the Gauls in Mysia. Mysia is the region that um, Pergamon lies in. So this is the, the, the sort of up-to-date one. So you've kind of got uh, a sense in which art is kind of creating a link between the battles of the 
Attalids and the Gauls that they fight against in the, the second century BC, going all the way back to fifth century BC with the Athenians and the Persians at Marathon, and then into the legendary past with the Athenians against the Amazons, and into the even more distant legendary past with the gods against the giants. Um, and we've got some remains of this, not the originals, we've got sort of Roman copies of these statues um, of various different types, of which you can see some of them here. So we have sort of the dying Amazon or the dead Amazon here, the dead Gaul, uh, giant, and then these two figures who are sort of still dying, so a dying Persian and a dying Gaul. And almost as though sort of the further back in time the battle was, the more dead the defeated enemies are, and then the Gauls are still sort of kind of succumbing, I guess. Um, and they were set up, these dedications, right next to the Parthenon. So um, the Parthenon's here and the ded athlete dedication's along the side here. So there was obviously a desire to sort of make a connection, to use myth to connect both to the Athenians and then sort of tie into that longer sense of a, of a Greek past, I think. And then finally, I think I've got sort of five, ten minutes-ish, hopefully. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how this carries on into the uh, third century AD, into the Roman period. So one of the things that's really interesting, particularly um, something I've done quite a lot of research on, is the way that the Greeks still continue to um, think about their past and their mythological traditions and their cultural traditions once they're part of the Roman Empire. So many ways um, that myth and identity is, is as important, if not more important than ever in the Roman period, when these cities are part of a massive empire, but they're also trying to say that they have particular claims to Greek identity and to Greek culture. So we're going to talk about Herapolis, which is a little city in Phrygia, um, in inland Asia Minor. So this is all modern day Turkey now. Um, you can go there, it's called Pamukkale, and it has these wonderful limestone sort of pools that are UNESCO sites. So you might have seen them on tourist pictures of Turkey if you've ever been there. Um, but it's a great site, it's got a wonderful uh, Roman city on the top of it as well. Lots of people go to the pools and never go and see the, the city, but it's, it's a great place to go. Um, so there's a, a very important theatre that was built here in the early 3rd century AD um, and it was dedicated to the patron god of the city, Apollo, and also to the imperial family, who are the Severan imperial family, Septimius Severus and his family at the time. Um, and it's been nicely reconstructed by the Italian archaeologists who worked there. Um, but what we're going to be looking at particularly is the reliefs that were at the bottom of the stage here. So this is the stage building um, and a lot, all the way along the podium here, you've got two relief friezes and they tell stories of the myths of Apollo and Artemis. So Apollo is the god of the city um, and obviously he's the brother of Artemis and Artemis is paired. So Artemis's story starts here on the left of the main door and then runs to the left of the stage and Apollo starts on the right and runs towards the right of the stage. Um, and they're very carefully paired um, in terms of the sort of the, the, the scenes that are chosen kind of reflect on one another. So both of them start with sort of birth scenes or kind of um, the reception of the children by um, Zeus, their father. So here we've got the baby Artemis sitting on Zeus's lap, um, surrounded by the rest of the Olympian gods. You've got Athena here with her helmet again, and, um, and then various other kind of figures surrounding them. And again, here you've got Zeus um, and on the right here, you've actually got the birth of Apollo. Um, which, uh, and then they kind of move into scenes of cult. So on the um, Artemis side, you have Artemis as a huntress. Um, so sort of uh, exploits associated with them and then the cult of these goddess, these deities. So we have um, Artemis as the huntress here and her typical Greek dress. But then what's interesting is that in the scene of cult, where we have a scene of a, a worshipper coming towards the cult statue, she's represented in a very different style. And this is the um, way that Artemis was represented at Ephesus, which was a big city on the coast of Asia Minor, still is. Um, well, you can go and see the remains again. So you're tying together the kind of the Greek tradition of Artemis with her local cult in Asia Minor, so sort of making it very particular to that area. Um, in the scenes of Apollo, we've got the Gigantomachy again. This is one of those scenes that crops up all over the place in Greek art. Um, so here we've got Apollo in the Gigantomachy in his uh, chariot, which is led by griffins. 
um, and accompanied by Athena. So again, they're sort of showing how they are part of the wider Olympian family. Um, and then you've got sort of snaky legged giant that he's beating here. But you also have lots of local myths showing on these myth reliefs as well. So in particular, myths of Marcias, who um, challenged Apollo to a, a, a debate in musical skill, a contest of skill, um, and was defeated and punished. So here we've got Apollo with his lyre and Athena, who throws away a pair of pipes that she's been playing and they are then picked up by Marcias, who's this figure here, um, and he is defeated by Apollo um, and his punishment for his hubris, his uh, arrogance and daring to kind of challenge the gods is that he's tied to a tree and flayed alive. So this is uh, um, Marcias being tied here and then the, the figure of the Scythian knife grinder who's going to flay him alive. So this is very much a sort of cautionary tale you can see about um, uh, you know, why you shouldn't challenge the gods, why you shouldn't put yourself uh, on their level. But it also ties in with local mythological traditions because a nearby city in Fidja um, said that that was the place that the myth had taken place. So, and that their river actually was a kind of metamorphosis of Marcias himself. Uh, we've also got the deaths of the Nibids, which are shown in the sort of corresponding section on the left hand side uh, in Artemis's section where we have Artemis here killing the female Niobids. Um, so the Niobids are the children of Niobe who had uh, 14 children, depending on which myth you read, there's different numbers, um, and said that she was better than Leto because she had so many wonderful children and then Leto's children, Apollo and Artemis, then kill all of Niobe's children because you know she shouldn't have dared to compare themselves to her mother. So um, here we have Artemis and then we have uh, Apollo on this one killing all the male children. So again this is a cautionary tale but it's also something that has a local resonance because there's a nearby city which uh, is said to be the kind of um, the, the stone version of Niobe. So the myth says that Niobe grieved so much that she turned into a mountain that she was sort of turned into stones with her grief. Um, and there's actually you can still go and see this mountain um, in, um, in, in Manisa in Turkey where you can go up, it's a sort of tourist site and see this. And it's supposed to look like the, the profile of a woman here with her forehead and her nose and her chin. Um, so there's local links with Artemis of Ephesus with the kind of worshipping of the goddess in this very distinctive local form here. Um, and Heraclius and Ephesus had a kind of uh, um, a, a, a contract of unity, a pomanoia, which is concord um, between the two of them, which we see on coins. And then there are also these uh, local myths as well. And Artemis of Ephesus is one of the most important religious figures of Asia Minor in the Roman period. So they're probably trying to sort of lay claim to some of her fame and charisma by identifying their patron god with that of a very important, much bigger city than they are. Um, and I'm going to finish in a moment, but I just wanted to mention that also this city has a relief that mentions its festival culture. So the festivals that happened in honor of the god Apollo. So the other thing is that you can see here is that the god Apollo sort of acts a bit of a kind of as a model for the victors who are going to be um, competing in his festival as well. So Apollo is often reflected on these reliefs as a victor holding a palm of victory here and being crowned for victory. So then in conclusion, I suppose the different ways we can think of myths then, myths are stories, but they're stories told for lots of different reasons. They can be told to praise the divine, to, to praise the gods, to kind of um, give you examples of their prominence and their achievements. They can be used as metaphors for human achievements, particularly these ideas of kind of pitching yourself on the side of good versus evil or civilization versus non sort of barbarianism or the other. Um, they can act as moral tales or exemplar to sort of tell you what is the right way to behave and sort of warn what will happen if you overstep the limits. Um, and they're also important for sort of senses of identity. So the way that Heraclius is tying themselves into their local, both the sort of the wider um, stories of Greek myth, which everybody knows, all Greeks know these stories, but then also making them particular to them and their area. So they have lots of different roles to play and um, in different contexts you find different aspects of the myths being sort of picked up on and that's what I find them so fascinating that you can sort of see how the same story is shown differently in different examples in art.
I so I suppose the other big source is vase painting because there are lots of them on vases as well. Um, and in some ways vases are better because often they have inscriptions and we can then sort of um, look at those. So I don't think you can just say architecture. It depends slightly at what period you're interested in. So for the 5th century BC, I think vase painting would be very useful as well. If you're looking in the Roman period, then you've got wonderful wall paintings from places like Pompeii um, and Herculaneum as well. So there's lots of different media actually that you do find mist on all sorts of things. And you also find it on like just very small, tiny objects like um, in, you know, intaglios of rings and things like that. So um, yeah, I focused on architecture today, but actually I think it's all over the place really. That's really interesting. Um, so I think history is, is really important. And actually what's interesting is that it's been sort of seen in different ways. So sometimes people used to say, okay, you've got all these cities going on about their past. And do, what do the Romans think about that? Do they think of it as kind of a challenge to their authority or something like that? But actually they don't seem to. So what we've got, we've got writings in people like Tacitus, where he's talking about, um, who to give money to in Asia Minor and they give money to cities based on their their history and their legendary traditions so that it was a way that cities could say look we're important because we go all the way back to X so Ephesus claims to be the place where Artemis is born for example um, so that they they could use their history as a kind of political tool in the present um, but I don't think they are looking forwards that much. You don't find that sense of it's all about the past. It's all about kind of tradition and um, the authority that you get from tradition, whether that's the actual historical past and things you've done, you know, famous battles or whether it's kind of the mythological past as well. And they sort of see them as a bit of a continuum. They don't see a kind of myth history clear divide, I don't think. Yeah, I'm not sure. There's a big debate about how much the Romans had a plan for, for their empire or not. Um, so, you know, some people think there was a big plan. I tend to, I see it more as sort of reactive that they kind of end up getting it by, by accident almost. <laughs> that they sort of they keep expanding and go, oh, right, we've got this area now, we better sort it out. But, you know, some, uh, sometimes you know, some emperors have more of a plan. I think um, Hadrian has quite a plan. But, and, and, and yeah, in terms of figures who look forward. So I guess Alexander the Great would be the key one who does seem to have a sort of aspiration to get as far as he can in his lifetime and defeat as much as possible. Um, so I think some of you hopefully are already applying to do classics at uni. Um, I just wanted to have a quick plug to say if you're not and are interested and particularly if you're year 12 and haven't kind of got around to think about what you want to do yet then do um, come to any of our open days that we'll be running later on in the year. So we have sort of university open days in June and then again in October. Um, and if you have applied to us, um, or even if you haven't, but you're still thinking about your applications, then um, there's still time for the UCAS deadline. We've got some resources on our webpage. So if you go to our classic supplying thing, we've got something called a virtual open day, which has got lots of, um, and even if you're not applying to us, it might be useful. We've got lots of videos from talks that we've done and things like that. So, um, and we're running a, a, a chat Q&A on Meet Engage in early January as well. So, um, oops, the, I've got to put the, the degrees have fallen off the bottom but um classics which is greek and, greek and latin does require an a level in latin or greek but all of the rest of our degrees classical civilization and ancient history don't have any prerequisites at all although lots of people come to them and learn classical